Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2012-2013 Bannon Institute, Sacred Texts in the Public Sphere. My name is Mick McCarthy. I'm the Executive Director of the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara. The Ignatian Center, just a word about the Ignatian Center. It is charged with promoting the distinctively Jesuit Catholic tradition of education here at SCU. And our vision is to become known throughout Silicon Valley and beyond as providing leadership for the integration of faith, justice, and the intellectual life. And a major effort in our achieving our vision and mission are these annual Bannon Institutes, which provide for the university a range of events that address matters of significance to the Jesuit intellectual tradition to foster an ethic of dialogue on issues of contemporary debate and, uh, and also among people of diverse religious and philosophical commitments. This year's Bannon Institute Sacred Texts in the Public Sphere explores the content, meaning, and activity of sacred texts from a range of traditions. This fall, we are centering our offerings around the current national election. You're aware that there is a national election going on? OK, good. Uh, inspired by what the newly inaugurated president usually appends to the oath of office, we begin this quarter with the series of sacred politics. So help me God, sac scriptural authority, and the public conscience. So today and the next six Tuesday afternoons, we will be looking specifically at scriptural politics. We'll be exploring how, script uh, how Christian texts are used within public discourse to justify a range of positions on significant debate among the electorate. Today, we are very pleased to have with us a guest lecturer from the South. Dr. Ted Smith is a graduate of Duke University, Oxford University, Princeton Theological Seminary, and Emory University. Before taking his current position at Vanderbilt, he, he, I'm sorry, before taking his current position, he had taught at the Divinity School at Vanderbilt, and now he is assistant professor of preaching and ethics at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. Professor Smith works at the intersection of practical and political theology, with special attention to the forms of preaching and worship how they, what forms they take in modern societies. His recent research has been exploring the notion of divine violence through a series of sermons, essays, and lectures, speeches uh, by the abolitionist John Brown. So for many reasons, his research agenda is really timely. Both in the United States as well as elsewhere, citizens claim sacred texts as providing authority from a higher law that justifies exception to the ordinary law of the state. Now, at times, this appeal to the higher law generates political activity that would re many would regard as extremely virtuous, even saintly. At times, however, appeals to the higher law yields acts of extraordinary violence. How a democracy navigates through such a complex reality is a matter of significant importance to us as a democracy. So it's Professor Smith's task now to offer us some guidance on that difficult question. My hope is that by assimilating his insights, we may actually become better citizens. And it will certainly move us more towards our vision of providing leadership for the integration of faith, justice, and the intellectual life. Please welcome then Professor Ted Smith, who will lecture on scriptural politics of democracy, divine violence, and the higher law. Well, I want to thank Father McCarthy for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm grateful to the Ignatian Center and for, to the Bannon Institute and then for the incredible hospitality that I've received since being here from Teresa Ladrick and Welpy and from Susan Chun. And I'm, I'm grateful to all of you too for, for being here. Uh, even those of you who are required to be here for a class, uh, you could have taken this as one of your absences. So uh, thank you. And I look forward to, to thinking these things through with you. Let's start with a picture. On the second floor of the rotunda, 
in the Kansas State Capitol, right by the entrance to the East Wing, there is what I'd call an icon of the scriptural politics of democracy. John Stuart Curry's mural depicts bleeding Kansas as the tragic prelude to the war. If you, if you take a look at this, what you see uh, are armed men massed under flags for the Union and for the Confederacy. You see a tangle of suffering bodies, black and white, that indicate some of the cost of this struggle. In the background, if you look, you'll see uh, people with guns, again, walking with wagons, oxen, right? It's like they're escaping violence, they're refugees maybe, or they're armed forces, we don't, we don't know. Um, but then in the further background, you, you wonder where they might be going. It is as if all nature is crying out here in bleeding Kansas with a prairie fire to the right and a cyclone to the left. And of course, at the center of it all stands John Brown with a Bible in his left hand and a rifle in his right hand. If you look closely, it's hard to tell in this light, but his hands are bloody, his hands are red, and there on the Bible, there is an alpha and an omega that give you some sense of the end times gospel that he is proclaiming. And there at his feet, you see some of the cost of that gospel. Now, Curry paints Brown, you know, with wild eyes and a flowing beard. It's like a caricature of an Old Testament prophet, right? This is Jeremiah with a Sharps carbine, as imagined by a painter in the 1930s. He paints Brown, I think, as a fringe figure who is also a kind of fundamentalist. That is, Brown gets framed in this picture as the lonely, idiosyncratic one who reads the Bible a little, a little too literally in some parts, remember those who were in bonds, and a little too selectively in others. It's as if he's a fundamentalist everywhere except for when it gets to the, that turn the other cheek stuff. So the picture shows a conflict. Brown is in the middle of it, but he is essentially alone. And he's got a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other. But both those who revere Brown and those who see him as a terrible threat have tended to understand him in just this way. Fringe figure, fundamentalist, violent. This reading of Brown, I think, has implications for the ways we understand politics today. If Brown is a fringy fundamentalist, then the problem he poses is isolated. It's limited to individuals and small groups at the edges of society. And the problem is defined especially by appeal to some kind of religion. So then arguing from scriptures in relation to public matter, that becomes the sure sign of fanaticism. So if the Bible comes out, the gun can't be far behind. So then the main threat to democracy is religious fanaticism. And the most important work is to police the public sphere against religious fanatics. I want to resist this view. And I want to begin my case by revising our portrait of Brown. It's worth noting that while the Bible was important to him, he drew on a huge range of sources, including the sacred memories of American political life to make his case. So an accurate portrait of Brown would show not just the Bible in his hand, but also the Mayflower Compact and the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, bloody relics of Bunker Hill, and more. So what defines Brown is not his use of the Bible, but as, as Father McCarthy said, his appeal to a higher law. And in appealing to a higher law, he joins a great throng in American history. He's not a loner on the fringes, not even a loner at the center. He joins a crowded, contested argument about the meaning of democracy in America. Indeed, I'd want to argue that appealing to some kind of higher law against the law of the land, that this is one of the defining features of American democracy.
In speaking of a higher law tradition, I don't mean to assert any kind of institutional continuity as if it was handed on from one person to the next within a single identifiable organization. What I do mean to describe is a, is a kind of characteristic way of thinking. I mean to describe a practice, a kind of meme that migrates between institutions, some of which are identified as religious and some of which are identified as secular. So I mean to describe this American habit of making appeal to some standard, a higher law, that stands in judgment of the accepted norms of a society. This tradition conceives the higher standard as a law. Because it's a law, it is the same kind of thing as that which it judges. And this tradition conceives of its preferred law as higher. Higher in the sense that it is closer to the way things should be, and higher in the sense that it has a stronger claim on our allegiance. Now, now, as a Presbyterian at a Catholic school, I'm acutely aware that I need to distinguish here what I mean by the higher law from a natural law tradition. The higher law tradition in America has fewer secure touchstones it has less specific content. Because it is so thin, then, it can be stretched to include a wide variety of different people and movements. The differences don't only extend to the content of the law. The differences in these various appeals to the higher law, they're also going to extend to the, to the, the sense that people make of, of how earthly laws and higher laws relate to one another. Do they just defy one another? Are they entirely separate? Does the earthly law participate in some sense in the higher law? Oh, a higher law tradition can accommodate a wide variety of answers to those questions. So what defines the higher law tradition is just the idea that there is some moral standard that's higher than the laws on the books. I mean something just about that base and simple and broad. So a higher law tradition defined like this is going to include many, if not most, forms of natural law. But it's also going to include other kinds of reasoning, like that of John Brown. Democracy in America, I want to argue, has been built through a series of appeals to the higher law. The Declaration of Independence justified revolution in the name of a series of self-evident truths that stood above the laws of the king and justified violent resistance. And the most significant expansions of membership in American democracy, like the 15th Amendment or the 19th Amendment, both of these have been accomplished by appeals to the higher law, and then they have been enforced with federal arms. It is hard to imagine American democracy as we know it now without some sense of a higher law. And I'm not sure I'd want to. The higher law has been perhaps the most significant engine for the reform of democracy in America. But the idea of a higher law has also inspired violence. Some of this, like the violence of those who heeded the call of the Declaration of Independence, has come to be regarded by most Americans as legitimate. But other violence in the name of a higher law is considered dubious. Think of, of Paul Hill, who killed abortion providers in Florida in 1994. Or Timothy McVeigh, who bombed the Oklahoma City Federal Building. Or the leftist radicals of the Weather Underground. All of these people, by the way, appealed to John Brown as a precedent. All of them said, we're just doing what Brown did. Violence does not follow in the wake of a higher law as a matter of logical necessity, might or might not happen. Martin Luther King joined an appeal to a higher law with an insistence on nonviolence. But violence has often accompanied appeals to a higher law. And violence for the higher law is often executed by people who are not authorized to commit violent acts. This makes sense. Because if the higher law gives a vision that's opposed to the law of the land, and if the law of the land is the sole power that can justify legitimate violence, then those who act in the name of a higher law will lack legitimacy. And so those who act in the name of the higher law have been called terrorists, radicals, and revolutionaries. And they have sometimes taken up violence in ways that have threatened the whole project of democracy in America. So appeals to the higher law, then, they have both furthered democracy and they've threatened democracy. And John Brown captures this ambivalence as well as anyone I know. 
So this afternoon, I want to do just a few things. I want to describe the ways Brown appealed to higher law. I want to sketch the broader higher law tradition. I want to consider the sharpest critiques of this tradition. And then I want to press towards a new way of thinking about the higher law that retains its critical power without licensing violence. A shorthand version for what I'm trying to do in this conversation with you is I want to seek a vision of the higher law that keeps the law in Brown's left hand and sets down the gun in his right. Let's see. The unchangeable law of God. This is uh, John Brown's politics of the higher law. He was born in 1800. He grew up in a family with deep roots in Puritan New England and strong commitments to the abolition of slavery. Brown, many, especially those psychologically inclined biographers of him, note he suffered a lifetime of traumatic losses, business failures, the death of children, the death of his first wife, death upon death, loss upon loss. But if his life was marked by loss, it was defined by a commitment to ending slavery. So you probably, you probably know the story, or at least the outlines of it, right? Uh, on October 16th, 1859, this, this month the anniversary comes, Brown led a band of 21 raiders in seizing the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. The group that he led included five African-American men and three of Brown's own sons. Brown and the main party quickly took the rifle works, the armory, and the arsenal. A second group moved through the countryside freeing slaves and collecting slaveholders as hostages. Hoping word of their attack would spread still further, the raiders let a train passing through Harper's Ferry go. And word did spread all the way to Washington. And so on October 17th, President Buchanan, who really didn't do much else, um, he, throughout this whole conflict, but he did order federal troops to Harper's Ferry. And Brown stayed a little too long in the village. There's an endless speculation of why he stayed too long. Did he, did he think the slaves were going to join him? Was he concerned for the welfare of his hostages? That's what he said later. Did he decide at some point, I'll do better as a martyr? Why did he stay? We don't really know, but he did stay. And local forces eventually hemmed him in, and they held him there until a company of federal Marines arrived. The company, in an eerie bit of uh, foreshadowing, was led by Colonel Robert E. Lee and Lieutenant Jeb Stewart. The next day, these federal Marines stormed Brown's blockhouse with bayonets, capturing or killing all the remaining members of Brown's party. Ten raiders died in the course of the attack, including two of Brown's own sons. The raiders killed four people, and they wounded at least nine more. It has to be said, the raid ended quickly, just a couple days, while there were 100,000 weapons at Harper's Ferry, while they controlled very briefly 100,000 rifles. You have to think what it would be like if they'd made their way out of there with those rifles into the mountains, established bases, sent the word out that slaves could come, get armed, and uh, participate in this rebellion. But they didn't escape with any of them. The raid was of very little military significance. But it began to take on significance when John Brown began to talk. His words divided the country, inspiring some and repulsing others. Brown was garrulous. He talked, he wrote all the time. This is true of many terrorists, right? When, once they're captured, the camera's on, they're talking. And Brown was a great talker. He called upon the history, traditions, and ideals of the nation. He justified insurrection in the name of natural rights. And he turned again and again to the Bible. And in all of these moves, Brown appealed to a higher law. He larded his appeals with images, quotations, and ideas from the Bible. But he turned especially again and again to the golden rule. When people asked Brown, why did you do what you did? He said, because I follow the golden rule. So on his, in his last speech to the court, a speech that was uh, printed endlessly across the North, he said, the court acknowledges, as I suppose, the validity of the law of God. I see a book kissed here, which I suppose to be the Bible, or at least, he said with a Calvinist condescension, at least the New Testament. <laughs> 
That teaches me that all things whatsoever I would that men should do to me, I should do even to them. It teaches me further, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. I endeavored to act up to that instruction. I say, I am yet too young to understand that God is any respecter of persons. The law of the golden rule was like the law in that courtroom. It was the same kind of thing. And because the golden rule was the same kind of thing as the law of the courtroom, the two could come into conflict. And when they did, there was no doubt in Brown's mind which was higher. So Brown made his case for the higher law through appeals to the Bible, no doubt about it. But he also made his case by blending biblical references with a vast range of other references. He, he was garrulous, but he was no systematician, right? He was not a, a theorist of the higher law. So writing from prison to a cousin who had expressed concern, you know, it's, it's a little bit, it's, a, it's kind of a family scandal when one of your cousins gets executed, right? So he's writing to reassure his cousin that, that this is okay. And he says, uh, remember our grandfather, Captain John Brown, fought and died in 1776. He too, Brown said, might have perished on the scaffold had circumstances been but very little different. Brown's defenders would take up this point, the point that Brown is just like the revolutionaries of 1776. They would take this up and pound it again and again. Indeed, one uh, preacher, Reverend Fales Henry Newhall, argued Brown was even better because in 1776, the rebels were fighting for themselves and Brown, Brown was fighting for other people. So here is a revolutionary sympathy, a revolutionary follower of the golden rule. So Brown blended biblical and nationalist references seamlessly. When after the Harper's Ferry raid, of course, there always comes the, the investigation, right? They didn't find these things beforehand. But afterwards, they go to the farmhouse where Brown and his party had staged their raid. And there they found weapons, lots of weapons, pistols, rifles, heavy machine guns, not machine, but heavy, heavy guns, guns that could fire large shells. They also found a document that Brown had written, a document called A Declaration of Liberty, by the representatives of the slave population of the United States of America. Now let's set aside for a minute what it means for even a white radical like Brown to speak for the slave population of America. What I wish I had a picture of, what I wish I could show you is what this declaration of independence that Brown wrote, I wish I could show you what it looked like. Because what they did was write it out on large pages, and then they, they sewed or glued all the pages onto a long cloth. They put a pole on either end of the cloth, and then they rolled it up. So what did it become? It became a scroll, right? So in one document, in its name, it's a declaration of independence. In this one document, Brown wrote, he is on the one hand name-checking what is still the most sacred document of the American nation, right? But in its form, it's calling to mind the law of God, right? So the, the holding together in the, the material form and in the words of this, this scroll, uh, Brown gives us his higher law. And it is full of references that only fill this out. It begins in words you might recall, I, I hope you recall, when in the course of human events, it become, anyone? anyone? <laughs> All right, so the Declaration of Independence, he's, he's stealing the words right out of that. And then he goes on to appeal to a series of self-evident truths. You might recognize these too, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Brown is using this kind of language to build up his idea of a higher law. He then jumps immediately to natural lights, rights, and then to talk of what he calls the unchangeable law of God. And in another direct quotation from the 1776 Declaration, Brown called for enslaved people, quote, to assume among the powers of the earth the same equal privileges to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. So in the reasoning of both of these declarations, there is a kind of deist ease in moving between the laws of nature, right, and the laws of nature's God. They can just slide right back and forth between the two. 
But if Jefferson and the other authors of the 1776 declarations fused these appeal to God and nature, to reason and revelation, Brown was adding another layer of authority to the mix. Because in quoting the 1776 declaration, he's not just appealing to the same sources, but he's appealing to the sacred text of the very government that he was opposing. All of these sources and more, they came together in the last lines of Brown's declaration. This is what they are. L listen, he says, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever, etc., etc. Nature is mourning for its murdered and afflicted children. Hung be the heavens in scarlet. I think these little compact lines, they give us a picture of Brown's mind. That first line, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice will not sleep forever. Does anyone know where that's from? Thomas Jefferson, notes on the state of Virginia. So he's quoting Jefferson. He moves from that into nature is weeping for her children. It, that's a, it's an adaptation of the Jeremiah text that gets picked up in the Gospels. Rachel is weeping for her children, only Rachel becomes nature, and nature with a capital N. And then the final lines of this, the heavens hung be the heavens in scarlet, he's quoting the, la the opening line of Henry VI, part one. Shakespeare gave the Duke of Bedford lines of mourning, hung be the heavens in black, Bedford said to open the play. But Brown was ready to fight, not to mourn. And so he concluded his declaration with a revision of Shakespeare's color scheme. Hung be the heavens in scarlet, Brown wrote. The higher law would be established in blood. So in one, two, three lines, Jefferson, Jeremiah, and Shakespeare, all in a paragraph with a reference to nature with a capital N thrown in for good measure. Brown could blend all of these traditions so easily and so persuasively because to his mind, they all testified to the same higher law. This is a very important piece here for getting the way this mentality worked. Truth was unified, right? All wise words, all of nature that was intelligible, and scripture all said the same thing. So you could appeal to any of them, and they weren't in conflict, and they would all be saying, the same thing. This emphasis, and, and so what he did was to draw those appeals together into an argument for a higher law. And what I want you to hear is that what really distinguishes Brown, what distinguishes him, is not that he only appealed to the Bible, right? Not that it was only scripture, but that he pulled together a huge array of sources to argue for a higher law. And in pledging his faith to a higher law, Brown was not alone. So let's go to a next section. Treason is our inheritance. One of the great lines uh, from any sermon in the 19th century. Treason is our inheritance. Brown's often framed as this lonely fanatic with idiosyncratic vision of the higher law. But his case galvanized abolitionist sentiments across the North, in part because he tapped into a higher law tradition that had deep and wide claim on the public imagination. In other words, lots of people were talking about the higher law in just the ways that Brown was. What he did was to put the pieces together in new ways with relevance to slavery. But many people were talking about the higher law. In a memorial sermon <coughs> entitled The Martyr's Death and the Martyr's Triumph, White abolitionist preacher George B. Cheever uh, set up a series of oppositions between what the state said and what God said. God says, Cheever said, thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant that has escaped from his master unto thee. The state says, thou shalt oppress him, thou shalt deliver him up. There's several minutes of God's, you can, you can hear it preach, right? God says, the state says, he's setting up these oppositions, working them back and forth. Which way do you think the people were supposed to go? With what the state said? You know. With what God says, this is what the Christian has to do. So Cheever saw Brown, the whole memorial oration is saying, this is what it looks like when you do what God says. And you might just get killed for your trouble. So Cheever joined a chorus that ranged beyond the ordained clergy. Henry David Thoreau, 
uh, would never have been caught dead in Cheever's church, right? Thoreau uh, preferred a lyceum pulpit to a, a lyceum podium to any pulpit, and he almost never quoted the Bible. But crucially, Thoreau shared Cheever's logic of the higher law. That's what I want you to get here, that this higher law talk is not something that only religious fanatics held to, right? The higher law is something with sacred sources, secular sources, all kinds of in-between sources. So you've got an evangelical like Cheever, you've got somebody like Thoreau, they're all talking higher law talk. Uh, about 90, uh, nine months after Brown's death, Thoreau described the effects of Brown's witness. The North, he says, I mean the living North, was suddenly all transcendental. It went beyond, behind the human law, and it went behind the apparent failure and recognized eternal justice and glory. So what Thoreau's saying is what Brown helped people do was get behind the appearance of law to the eternal law. When the city fathers in Concord, Massachusetts, where, where Thoreau lived, when they wouldn't toll the church bell to mark Brown's execution, Thoreau went there and pulled the bell himself because he'd been talking about conscience. He'd been talking about the individual. He'd been talking about what it looks like to live a life fully awake for decades, and he had wondered if anyone was ever going to do it. And he said, Brown did it. He explicitly compared, in another speech, he explicitly compared Brown to Christ for our age, and he was joined in that by Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said that in dying, uh, Brown makes the gallows as noble as the cross because he followed a higher law. In a, there were a lot of New Englanders who thought like this, and they loved Brown in part because Brown looked like New Englanders thought a Puritan should look. Right? He, he was gaunt. He was gaunt in part because he was extremely ascetic. He was also gaunt because he was poor. Right? He, just, he was bankrupt most of his life. He was often a refugee, a fugitive from justice, on the run. But he looked like a good Puritan, right? And he could trace his ancestry back to a signer of the Mayflower Compact. So you have to, I mean, you know how America goes, right? We get all antsy and think, oh, it, we were such better people back then. And now we, you know, look at our kids. Oh, my gosh, it's just all crashing and burning. Well, this is not a new theme. This happens every couple decades, right? And when it happened in the 1840s and 50s, it was a bunch of newly prosperous New Englanders worrying that they'd lost their Puritan spine, right? And now along comes someone like Brown. He looks like a Puritan. He talks like a Puritan. Maybe we've still got it, right? So Wendell Phillips, uh, one of the most prominent New England preachers of his time, reminded his hearers that the state, this is um, in a sermon entitled The Puritan Principle and John Brown. He reminded his hearers that the state of Massachusetts was founded in defiance of the edicts of the king and in obedience to the law of God. The motto of these founders, Phillips said, was not law and order. The motto of the founders of Massachusetts was God and justice, a much better motto. This motto and the fidelity to a higher law that it implied meant, Phillips said, that treason is our inheritance. Hold on to that. Treason is our inheritance. The Puritans planted it in the very structure of the state Philip said, and when their children try to curse a martyr like the prophet of old, half the curse at least turns into a blessing. I thank God for that, Massachusetts. So Phillips was right to name Brown as connected to a deep river of thought that ran through New England. I want to move a, a little more quickly here and just say that that river got especially uh, full during the 1850s with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, which has a lot to do with the entry of California into the Union as a free state, right? Um, there was opposition to the idea that the, that the territories seized from Mexico in the war should enter as free states or as slave states. A lot of controversy over this. The way they broke the deal was by saying they'll be free states, California can be a free state, but as part of the compromise, the North has to respect slavery where it already stands, and you get this Fugitive Slave Act, which holds that uh, if a slave should escape to the North, Northern forces, Northern officials, have to help in returning the slave to the South, right? So this was the complex deal that everybody put together. It appalled, it, it's hard to tell you how, it, it, uh, you think how angry 
uh, the left is with their, the perceived portrayal of Barack Obama, right? Exactly that mad did New Englanders get that Daniel Webster, their greatest senator, had stood up for this fugitive slave law. Now Webster was presenting himself as just a pragmatist, a kind of law and order man. He says, look, the Constitution established slavery. Who are we? We've got to follow the law, people, right? Besides, what are you going to do with these crazy Southerners? This is the best we can do. Don't, 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 don't try to put together some ideal situation. It's, it's, it's just politics. We've got to cut deals. It's not what we want, but it's a good deal, and it happens to be in line with the Constitution. So it's a pragmatic, realist appeal to the laws of the land. He gave a speech uh, in, in the Senate that practically won the day, pulling many from the North over to this. Well, William Henry Seward, so you can, Seward uh, thought this was, was awful. Gilbert, we're done with Haven. Let's go to Seward. Uh, Seward, uh, the senator from New York, it's his very first speech ever in, uh, in the Senate, right? And he rises to oppose the venerable Daniel Webster. And he entitles his speech, the higher, well, he, it becomes known as the higher law speech. And what he does in this speech is say, well, yeah, we've got the Constitution, um, but there is a higher law that we have to fight fight for. He says, the Constitution regulates our stewardship. The Constitution devotes the domain to union, to justice, to defense, to welfare, and to liberty. But, he says, there is a higher law than the Constitution, which regulates our authority over the domain and devotes it to the same noble purposes. Seward appealed to a higher law established by the creator of the universe, but his arguments depended less on references to the Bible than to Burke, Montesquieu, and Machiavelli. From these sources, on the floor of the Senate, Seward argued for a law that was higher than the Constitution under which he was elected, a higher law that was both better and more binding. So Seward's hired law speech set the vocabulary for opposition to the Fugitive Slave Act. Everyone in the North, if you were anybody, you had to preach a higher law sermon, right? There were more than 2,000 sermons preached in the North denouncing the Fugitive Slave Act. Almost all of them are using the language and rhetoric of the higher law. So there's two, two things I want you to take away from this. The first is that John Brown was hardly alone in appealing to a higher law. Similar appeals rang out from more and less distinguished pulpits and even from the floor of the Senate. The second thing I want you to take away is that what distinguishes the idea of a higher law as it plays out in the United States is not the source of the law. Scripture, national history, reason, conscience, and more, they all ran together. You could have the Golden Rule, Edmund Burke, Lexington and Concord, William Shakespeare, and more, all in one speech or sermon. This great mashup, right, of all of these kinds of, of sources. So the distinguishing feature of the higher law tradition in, in America is not the source, but the structure of the appeal. The higher law tradition described a moral code that was both better than the laws of the state and more binding on us, a higher law. And many of the exponents of the higher law tradition did fit into Will Wendell Phillips' de description of a tradition running from the Puritans through their genetic descendants in New England, upstate New York, Ohio, and Iowa. But the higher law tradition runs deeper and wider than any merely Puritan patrimony. So that's the next section. Beyond the Puritan principle, what I want to argue here is that it, it, when, when contemporary social critics talk about the higher law tradition, they, they usually present it as some kind of peculiar disease of the New England mind, right? This is, this is something that, that it's from the Puritans and then it gets passed to the Yankees and it plays out in this particular way. I think that neglects a very significant part of the history. You have uh, African-American preachers, especially, but orators of many kinds, sla enslaved and free, who are using language of the higher law before William Seward is even elected, right? So the higher law tradition emerges from this back and forth between black and white Americans. Frederick Douglass drew on this long, complex tradition in a speech he gave at Harper's Ferry in 1881. Now, Douglass had, cons had consulted with Brown just days before the raid on Harper's Ferry. Brown really wanted Douglass to come with him. Douglass was like, I I've been south. I know what those people are like. No, 
we're not, we're not going. Uh, I'm not going. You're crazy. You're going to die. And Brown, I think the way they left it, it's murky, but to me it looks like they both agreed it was better that Brown should die and Douglas should live. And so they parted in peace. Uh, 1881, at Harper's Ferry, Brown is giving an oratory on one of these many, many death celebrations marking the martyr's anniversary of Brown's death. His, his, the date of the raid is never celebrated. It's the date of the execution, because that's what you do with a martyr, right? You mark the death date. Uh, he, as, as he preaches, uh, he talks about an inner law that, is, uh, that you can see with the inward eye if a man is just and true. And he says Brown uh, broke the, the law of the land because he lived for this inward law. And in appealing to an inward law, Douglas drew upon a long tradition of black and white political oratory. In 1837, 1837, remember uh, Seward's speech is 1850. 1837, the African-American-led American Moral Reform Society used higher law language to make its case. And this 1837 reference is the earliest I find to use this specific phrase. Later on, um, Henry Highland Garnett, he offered an even more searing version of the higher law theology in his 1843 Address to the Slaves. He called enslaved people to resist, even if resistance involved violence. And he grounded this call in the positive duty of all people to obey the higher law. God commanded people to worship only God, love their neighbors, keep the Sabbath, read the Bible, and train up their children in the ways of God. Slavery did not excuse people from these duties, Garnett said. To such degradation as slavery, it is sinful in the extreme for you to make voluntary submission. You're bound to obey the Ten Commandments. Slavery keeps you from, from following the Ten Commandments. Therefore, you must resist, and you must take up arms if necessary. And he says, the forlorn condition in which you are placed does not dest destroy your moral obligation to God. So here with Garnett, the higher law becomes a demand to resist and defy the laws. Many other African-American preachers and leaders invoked the higher law through the 1840s and 50s. J.W. Loguen, who became a bishop in the AME Church, Zion, AME Zion Church, was himself a fugitive slave when he appealed to the higher law to call the city of Syracuse to declare itself a city of refuge. Samuel Ringgold Ward declared in an 1850 speech in Boston that if the fugitive slave is traced to our part of New York State, he shall have the power of Almighty God to protect him. Francis Ellen Watkins, who taught at the African Methodist Episcopal Church's Union Seminary, mocked those who hid behind the claim that we have no higher law than the Constitution. There was a higher law, she said, and Mary Ann Shad, who after the war became the first woman to enroll in the law school of Howard University, called upon the higher law in an 1858 sermon in Chatham, Canada. As the law of God must be to us the higher law in spite of powers, principalities, self-priests, or selfish people to whom the minister, it is important that we assert boldly that nowhere does God look upon this chief crime with the least degree of allowance, nor are we justified in asserting that he will tolerate those in any wise support or sustain it. You can't hide behind the fact that you are following the law, Shad is saying. So African-American women and men developed the language and logic of the higher law over several decades of resisting slavery. This tradition can't be reduced uh, to the status of an application or a derivation from Puritan legacies. Uh, it's coming from earlier dates. It differs in that they'll, the, these orators will appeal to Haiti and the revolution in Haiti as a great example. You don't hear even the most radical white preachers saying anything like that. And Henry Highland Garnett's 1843 address um, was heard by many whites, including John Brown. So John Brown heard that speech by Henry Highland Garnett, and he was moved that, uh, so deeply that the, re the repeatedly bankrupt abolitionist, Brown, he paid to have Garnett's sermon published and distributed. So the higher law is not only a Puritan principle, as Wendell Phillips' sermon and a lot of contemporary today social critics seem to suppose. It's the product of long exchanges between black and white preachers as they address the state's collusion with the sin of slavery. Now I want to click through a series of other images here 
to show you others who've held this view. Orestes Brownson, I don't know if you know who he is, you should. He's an amazing and interesting figure, one of the, one of the greatest minds of the 19th century. He's a follower of Emerson, he's a transcendentalist who comes to think, wait, this whole thing is just a vacuous individualism. So he becomes a Roman Catholic. And then he's the most, the most penetrating critic, 19th century critic of transcendentalism by far. Now, Orestes Brownson can smell the transcendentalism in the higher law, right? He, he just knows it's there and he doesn't like it. But he says the problem is not that they appeal to a higher law. The problem is that people like Thoreau think that they can just sit in their study and know what the higher law is without consulting any kind of community. So he says the problem is individualism and individual access to the higher law. This is going to end in chaos and tyranny. But, he says, the laws of the state have to be subject to the higher law of God. It's just that that law is known by the church. What I want you to see here is that Brownson supported the Fugitive Slave Act, denounced the higher law speech and the reasoning in it, but he denounced it because it was individualist. Brownson still is going to say, you have to have a higher law, and of course you have to follow it. You just know it through the church. On and on. Even the Southerners who opposed the higher law <coughs> at the time, they're invoking the higher law themselves, and they're also invoking it in the name of violence. So, for instance, Elijah Lovejoy is an abolitionist. He runs a press in, in Illinois, completely legal, but a, 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 a pro-slavery mob appeals to a higher law and destroys his press and murders Lovejoy. So on both sides, you had people who uh, used a higher law for violence. You've also got, of course, Martin Luther King's great letter from a Birmingham jail, which uses this language of the higher law. I think in the class we'll talk more about that. As in the 1850s, so today, higher law language continues to run across the full spectrum of religion and politics in the United States. On May 11, 2012, at Occupy Wall Street tweeted, there is a higher law than the law of the government. That's the law of conscience. And in 2008, presidential hopeful and Baptist preacher Mike Huckabee called for amending the Constitution to a ban abortion. Some of opponents did not believe in changing the Constitution, Huckabee said, quote, but I believe it's a lot easier to change the Constitution than it would be to change the word of the living God. And that's what we need to do, to amend the Constitution so it's in God's standards rather than try to change God's standards so it lines up with some contemporary view. So think about this. From Occupy to Huckabee, American preachers, pundits, and activists still appeal to the higher law. Now, claiming that wide a tradition of the higher law, <coughs> risk stretching the definition until it's just too thin to do any real work in an argument. But I've hinted at the deep differences in how people have understood the content of the higher law and how they might justify claims to know that content. Those differences in the substance of the higher law and in the sources of knowledge about the law, they matter. But even across those differences, appeals to the higher law share a certain structure that has its own significance. And the significance begins to come, become clearer with the realization that not everyone sees the good of making a strict distinction between earthly and higher laws. Political theorists from Hobbes to Hegel to Gillian Rose have worried about the social consequences of making this kind of distinction. They've often earned charges of totalitarianism for their flattening of norms that might finally transcend the laws of the state. But the strongest challenge to the higher law in recent years comes not from the camps of Hobbes or Hegel, but from a centrist, pragmatic tradition that's committed to liberal and democratic values. Against a politics of heedless purity. I want to turn now to historian Sean Willens. Willens de developed a critique from just this liberal and pragmatic center in his 2005 review of David Reynolds' biography of John Brown. Willens could never be mistaken for one with sympathies for slaveholders. In a distinguished string of works, he's displayed deep commitments to a liberal democratic society with equal opportunity for all. But Willens' vision of a democratic society had no place for old John Brown. 
In his essay, Willens reminded readers that Brown was cited as an inspiration by Timothy McVeigh, the Unabomber, and many other domestic terrorists. Willens did not hesitate to extend that label, terrorist, to Brown, calling him an example of a long line of righteous American terrorists. The contrast, Willens wrote, was not between moderate and radical, not between left and right. The contrast posed by Brown, Willens said, is between a savage, heedless politics of purity and a politics of the possible. Brown was a fanatic, and the mark of his fanaticism was violence in the name of a higher law. We've also got an argument from Andrew Del Banco uh, at Columbia. Who, he's, he's pressing along this same line of critique against a higher law and towards a more moderate middle. Both Del Banco and Willens are concerned especially about people like Paul Hill. Hill cast himself in the legacy of the higher law and of John Brown in particular when he killed John Britton and James Barrett outside the Pensacola Ladies Center in 1994. Britton, a physician, worked part-time at the center and provided abortions for women there. Barrett was his bodyguard. After Hill shot the men, he cited Brown as precedent for his actions, and he hoped that the Pensacola Ladies Clinic would become for anti-abortionists anti what Harper's Ferry was for abolitionists. And he developed his theory of the higher law in a long document that you can find online if you're interested. And what he appeals to, what he develops, is a notion of the moral law of God. And he uses the Westminster Shorter Catechism to kind of split open uh, a, a gap between the literal text of the Ten Commandments, which say, thou shalt not kill, and his understanding, which, then, which, gets, which comes to mean, thou shalt not kill innocence. So you can kill those who take lives, especially if they're taking the lives of innocents. And by this theory, he gets at what he calls the moral law of God. But it, whatever you think of the argument itself, the structure of higher law thinking is right there. So Del Banco disagreed with Hill's justification for his, ac for his actions, but he agreed with Hill's account of the parallels between violent anti-abortion activists like Hill and violent abolitionists like Brown. The parallel should remind us, Del Banco wrote, that all holy wars, whether metaphoric or real, from left or, from or right, bespeak a zeal for combating sin. Not tomorrow, not in due time, not in Lincoln's phrase, by putting it, quote, in the course of ultimate extinction, but now. So Del Banco is in this tradition, and, and Willens, they're in the tradition of Daniel Webster. They're basically liberals, right? But they're liberals who want to preserve a kind of democracy that is free from these appeals to the higher law. I think it's a useful criticism, line of critique, especially because it has a lot more integrity than many of the critiques of higher law that I see out there. Usually, these critiques focus on the conclusions of the argument. You don't agree with somebody? Well, you say, you're a fanatic. You're appealing to the higher law. But then when somebody is making arguments that you agree with, you say, now that is some profound spiritual reasoning, right? Um, so we get these kinds of splits, depending on our, our sides. Del Banco and Willens, they discern the structure of the appeal to higher law. And they say, look, even if we agree with the conclusions, the structure of the argument is a problem here. And the structure of the argument threatens democracy. It threatens democracy because democracy is about conversation. It's about give and take. You can't talk to somebody with a gun, right? So the, the whole deliberative function of democracy is undermined, they say, by this kind of violence. It creates a threatening environment where people can't speak. It, it, it's, it's not ruled by, the, by a majority. It's not ruled by conversation. It's just ruled by force. This is a, you got to, you, you have to feel the bite, uh, I, I hope by now, of both this critique and of the argument of a higher law. But I want to argue that rejecting any notion of the higher law creates problems of its own. It demythologizes politics, leaving us with nothing more than prevailing laws and customs. And it's not just that these laws and customs are insufficient to generate social change. It is that when prevailing laws and customs are the only sources of authority, they attain a mythological status of their own. As Theodore Adorno wrote, demythologization devours itself as the mythical gods like to devour their children, leaving behind nothing but what merely is. Demythologization recoils into the mythos, for the mythos is nothing else than the closed system of eminence of that which is. <clears throat> 
I'll develop this more in Q&A if you want, but the core argument here is that the rule of law, elevated above all else, ceases to become a kind of working pragmatism, but because it closes off critique, not just by its content, but by its kind, it becomes a religion unto itself. So pragmatism then becomes mythical, the rule of law becomes religion. So I want to argue that what we need is not the elimination of any kind of higher law, but a rethinking of what kind of politics the higher law entails. So to messianic politics. The notion of a higher law fits with many of our deepest moral, political, and theological instincts. People who remember the story of Shifra and Pua, the midwives who found ways to defy Pharaoh's command to kill boys born to Jewish women, People who remember Shifra and Pua have reason to believe in the higher law. So do people who read the prophets. So do people who follow a Messiah who was executed according to the laws of his time and place. So do people who live by a Koran that set itself above and against prevailing laws and customs. So do people who live in a country founded in defiance of the king's laws and of international law, such as it was at the time. So do people who who reject the long collusion of this country's laws with slavery and its aftermath, and so do people committed to human rights that transcend the laws of any particular nation. I want to argue that we need some sense of higher law to make sense of these deep memories, convictions, and instincts. The problem comes with the ways the higher law is linked to violence. The higher law underwrites violence when we understand the higher law as something like the perfection of earthly public policy as something of the same kind as earthly law, only better. Walls made flesh and dwelling among us. Then fulfillment of the law would involve a perfection of society's conformity to the heavenly rule. This is the vision I want to argue against, that what the higher law is, is like perfect public policy. And then what the messianic fulfillment of that is, is when the law is perfectly established and everybody is doing it. Because if you believe in that kind of higher law, then you have strong incentives to take up violence to establish it. Contrast this vision of a higher law as perfect public policy that it's up to us to achieve with uh, two theorists, contemporary theorists. First of all, uh, 20th century, Giorgio Agamben, his vision of what he called the messianic fulfillment of law. It's a larger argument, but let me just go right to a picture that I think makes it clear. This is a, a, a painting by Paul Klee. You may know him, the German Expressionist, a painting called The Law. What Klee is depicting here is a law, is, is, is a page in which you have vaguely Semitic letters, right? The kind of echoes of the law, but you can't assemble them into any kind of sense. Right? You can't assemble them into something that you could possibly enforce. Instead, it's a kind of aesthetic experience. It is, in Agamemnon's words, the law delivered, the law delivered from its alliance with force. So what Agamemnon's wanting to do is to split, to separate force and law. And he appeals to Paul in, in the epistle to the Romans to do this. He says that what Paul's talking about is not the negation of the law, not a, a no to the law, but an idea that the law has been captured by the powers of sin and death, is lost in its alliance with the powers of sin and death. And it's lost in those as it is enforced upon other people. So Agamemnon's vision of the messianic fulfillment of law is that law is no longer enforceable. It's no longer even the kind of thing that one could enforce. Instead, it's like Psalm 119. Oh God, your law is my delight. It, it is, it's like Torah study uh, in certain communities of the Orthodox, where the point is not to get the, the law right so that you can then go enforce it. It's just because reading the law together is holy and good and delightful, right? So these are aesthetic relationships to the law. Do you, do you see what Agamben is driving at here? This picture kind of shows you what it might look like. My great worry about Agamben's system, though, is that it ends up eliminating. He doesn't eliminate the law. The law stays. But what he eliminates is the moral dimension of the law. What he eliminates is the normative quality of the law. And so what he ends up eliminating is really ethics itself. He's Foucauldian, so this is fine with him, right? Uh, because ethics is mostly being used. It's being aligned with the state in, in forms of biopower. This would be better, right? Better just to contemplate the law in all its beauty and glory. 
But I remember, uh, I remember Shields Green, who died with John Brown. And uh, I think we need stronger words of justice to be able to speak about slavery in the United States. We need to retain a normative quality. So I want to argue for that uh, using the Gershom Sholem's reading of the book of Jonah. In Jonah, and, the, and there's a slide here of, of Jonah preaching in Nineveh. He, Sholem tells again the story of Jonah in Nineveh. You may, you may know the story, right? So Jonah, Jonah is told to go to Nineveh and tell that great city to repent. Well, Jonah doesn't really want to do that. He doesn't want them to repent. He wants them to die, right? Because they've got it coming. By the law, they should die. They've got it. So there's, you know, there's a whale, there's a ship, there's a storm. Eventually, Jonah ends up in Nineveh. God is wily and uh, persistent. So there he is, and Jonah proclaims the good news, says you've got 40 days, and then God's going to destroy you. Um, Jonah is looking forward to this. He camps out on the hill so he can watch it, but Nineveh repents. Worst of all things, right? Even the cows, if you read the story carefully, it says even the cows are in sackcloth and ashes. So the place doesn't just repent, it really repents. Um, and destruction does not come. Sholem says, this is what messianic politics look like. As in Agamben, you've got this division between force and law. You've got a separation between law and its enforcement. Jonah just comes and announces the law. He announces a righteous judgment, right? But he doesn't enforce it. And in fact, because in the interim there is this moment of repentance, the law is never enforced. So what Sholem says is, this is the work of the Messiah. What the Messiah does is announce judgment without executing judgment. The Messiah opens up in time a gap between the announcement of justice and the execution of justice, and that gap is what we call history. All of history unfolds between the pronouncement of justice and the execution of justice, and Sholem says, God willing, that execution is deferred infinitely over the horizon. The best example I know of this in contemporary society is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Think, if, you, if you know the commission, despite, say it doesn't live up to its best ideals, but at its heart, what it does is say, we're going to tell the truth about what happened. And we're not going to tell the truth in a he said, said, she said, relativist kind of way, where everyone gets their own truth and we pretend like everyone's values are equal. No, there's a telling of the truth with judgment. But there is, with that judgment, a suspension of the execution of the penalty. And the hope is that in that space between the announcement of judgment, where the normative is retained, and a kind of end, right, where the judgment is executed, that something can emerge. What I want you to see is emerging there is that it is a politics that is not commanded by the law. It's a politics that is made possible by the suspension of the law. And that's a hard, I'll, I'll say that again. It's not a politics, messianic politics is not commanded by the law, but it's made possible by the suspension of the law. It's made possible by the announcement of justice and the deferral of its execution. So how, how do we understand John Brown then? John Brown said, you should understand me like Moses. I led the people out of slavery and I brought them the law. When he knew he was going to die, John Brown said, you should understand me like Samson. You know how Samson died, right? He was captured by the Philistines, but he pushed on the temple and he brought down the temple on top and killed all the Philistines with him. He said, I'm going down, but slavery is going with me. I want to say we should, uh, we should understand Brown more like Jonah. Because Brown does pronounce judgment in his own body, in his suffering. He pronounces judgment, but he doesn't execute it. It's not accomplished in his lifetime. On his deathbed, he says, you had better, all you people of the South, prepare yourselves for a settlement of this question. It must come up for settlement sooner than you are prepared for it. And the sooner you commence that preparation, the better for you. You may dispose of me very easily. I'm nearly disposed of now. But this question is still to be settled. This Negro question, I mean. The end of that is not yet. The end, Brown says, is not yet. And in opening up a meantime between the now of announcement of justice and the not yet of its execution, Brown plays the role of Jonah. 
Like Jonah, he would rather have executed the judgment himself. He would like at least to get to see it happen. But like Jonah, he was caught up in a grace that was larger than he could imagine. Messianic politics always is. Thanks. Thank you, uh, and um, thanks for sitting through what is a long, long talk. You forgive my uh, inner southern preacher. But, uh, <laughs> I'd welcome your questions, and uh, I'd especially like questions from, from students, but questions from, from anyone. Please. My question is about uh, John Brown education. He seems so erudite. He quotes so many things. Yeah. Uh, it was erratic. He, um, he had some years of formal education, but uh, in many ways, uh, he's self-educated and, um, and pretty much what we hear him quote is about what he read. Uh, he read the Bible, he read politics, and he read Shakespeare. Not unusual for an ambitious 19... And he memorized pretty much all of it, right? Because he wasn't surfing it. Yeah. Playing off that question about John Brown's education today, I mean, well, you mentioned William Seward quoting all those, you know, vast historical figures. I, well, maybe it's probably because I don't watch enough C-SPAN, but I can't remember anyone quoting a lot of vast historical figures in the past. Do you think that's why we use religion in the natural law arguments of today, because it's the most widespread? That's, a, that's an interesting point. You know, when I read 19th century oratory, I have two feelings. One feeling is, oh, we have fallen so far, right? Um, you read Webster, and then you watch C-SPAN, and it, it hurts, right? But the other thing that I feel as I read these is, at that time, they were saying, we have fallen so far, right? It, it's always what people think, and what they miss is the newness emerging around them. So that, that kind of checks my nostalgic urges. So why do people go to go to religion now. I think, um, I don't think they go to it more uh, than, they, than they used to. I think um, one thing you could say, though, that has undoubtedly happened in political oratory in the United States is it is more audience tested than it used to be. And I think one reason people go to religious language is when it works with their particular constituency. Um, Seward didn't really know what was going to work. Um, he might have had his ideas, but not really. And people thought his career was over when he gave that speech because he, uh, he opposed Webster. Yeah, please. My old memory can't remember. There was a historian who was a friend of President Kennedy's. And Kennedy wrote that book about those 12 figures, all of whom lost their political positions because of unique moral stances. And this particular historical figure, writing about what was called the irrepressible conflict, uh, was writing against a religious view of Civil War history uh, that it shouldn't have happened. And uh, he said, basically, that history is not its own salvation. And after sounding like a pragmatic, most of his professorial life, he winds up with that statement, which is a philosophical, theological statement. Who knows? And I guess my question to you goes to your discussion of John Brown and Civil War history. Uh, as I understand, it's still moving in historical circles. Yeah. Whether or not that war really was a conflict. Right. There is a, you know, the Civil War is this perennial topic in the United States, and seasons come and seasons go. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, McPherson's uh, Battle Cry of Freedom was, uh, the, was a, a defining book. And I, so I think in those decades, the, the ascendant view was that it was a necessary conflict, it was terrible, but it was just. And we should do it again if we have to, right? There's that kind of uh, view to it. Um, we there being the North, right? <laughs> um, but now the, the other view, I would say, is on the rise. You, you have um, books like Skip Scout's On the Altar of the Nation or Drew Gilpin Faust's A Republic of Suffering, both of which are saying there's this massive cost to the Civil War. And um, we're just not sure it's worth it. It's the same mentality that is remembering the firebombing of Dresden and saying what we thought was the good war, World War II, 
Not so sure now. Um, my, one of the reasons I was interested in Brown is because he, he just, I, I didn't know what I thought of him, right, when I started in. Um, so to find a, use him as a way to, to kind of get it deep into those questions. Um, but I, I do think both sides in the, in the Civil War were participating in this kind of bad version of the politics of the higher law. Um, it's hard for me to imagine what a, a truly messianic politics at that time would have looked like, but I think that's part of the nature of messianic politics. It's not commanded. It is rather invented by people on the ground. It's Aristotelian politics kind of in that full creative expressive sense of the word. Um, but it takes people like Tutu. I mean, who could have foreseen the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? It takes acts of that level of creativity, I think. Please. Uh, yeah, the next question would be considering one of the very last points you made is uh, comparing Brown with Jonah because of his announcement of judgment but not executing said judgment. Uh, I, I, I question the point only because it certainly wasn't for lack of trying. That's right. That, uh, with, with Jonah's point, he was announcing judgment and then was going to let God take the action and then they repented in the meantime while with Brown, unless you assume that he was captured on purpose. That's a, that's, a, that's a brilliant question, and it presses me to, to clarify something that is very important to me. Did, am, when I reframe Brown like that, am I saying that he intended to be Jonah? No. Am I saying, this is, a, this is you know, just kind of full-on warning, a theological claim about to be made. I'm saying he is caught up in a process that is larger than himself, that outruns his intentions and that makes him into Jonah in spite of what he would aspire to for himself. He wanted to be Moses, and then when that didn't work out, plan B was Samson, right? He never, never compared himself to Jonah. But it's worth remembering, Jonah didn't want to be Jonah either, right? That wasn't Jonah's intentions. So if we take that story seriously as a story, you know, a comic revelation in a way of how the world works, of how God moves in the world, um, then we would be looking for people who find themselves in the role of Jonah in spite of their best intentions. And I, I, I think that's where I'd want to cast Brown. And, you know, probably myself too. That's where we'll, I, I think that's where we end up. We have time for one more question, and, and we always try to privilege students on the last question. Or somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw your hand uh, coming up. Um, Yours, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. Um, what happens when they get linked in authorized ways? When we have um, yeah. authorized government policy that links the higher law with um, with violence? Yeah, that's a that's a great question um, because that is one of the, the that's one of the defining features of our times, right? I think one of the ironies of the U.S. since 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 9/11, one of the ironies is that we are engaged in a holy war against the category of holy war. I mean, do, you, do you feel the irony of that? Right? Uh, yeah, and I think, and because we think that what we are doing is combating holy war out there, we blind ourselves to the ways in which our own policies, especially, especially when they are legal, the ways in which our own policies take on that kind of holy war. This is one of the sections I I just kind of breezed through, but this is what I mean when the rule of law becomes a religion unto itself. Then what you become capable of is a holy war against the category of holy war, all right? I think, um, let me, and here I'll, I'll just risk being, I was theological, now I'll be political. One of my worries 
I mean, the worry, I think, about the Bush administration was that there was a willingness to act apart from law. So the Bush administration was willing to act for a higher law in ways that were not licensed by the law, right? Willing to engage in these kinds of, uh, in detentions that were illegal, in wars that weren't authorized through the, through the usual means. My worry about the Obama administration, though, is that what you get is a, is a kind of stretching of law to incorporate these same activities that were once illegal, right? And so you're pulling what once was illegal into the regime of law and legitimating it. Um, I'd say that's exactly what happened with John Brown. Lincoln denounced Brown's raid when it happened. He said, this is appalling, it breaks every law. And then deep in the Civil War, I mean, this is where Lincoln, you, he's just, he's so reflective. He said when he okayed Sherman's march through the South, this is a giant John Brown raid on the whole South. And what he saw was that he was authorizing, he was making legal that which before had been illegal. And I think he was right to flinch at that, right? Um, I'd want us to, I'd want to flinch at that dynamic as it unfolds today, too. So thanks, thanks to all. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Ted, for really a, a, a wonderful, wonderful lecture. I, I love the category of holy war against the category of holy war. That's a very, very helpful, helpful thing. If just a few uh, uh, business items. Thank you for your attendant, attendance. Those of you, uh, uh, these, these lectures are offered free of charge. Should anyone wish to uh, make a donation, there are uh, envelopes, or you could go uh, to our website. Second, there are at your places uh, evaluation cards. Well, it's, hel it's helpful for us to get feedback on these events. So if you can easily, Ted has actually been stuffing the ballot box by saying, tell these people, tell them to, to come back, right? But in your own way, uh, if, you can, if you can fill that out, uh, if it's convenient for you, and deposit them on the way out. There is next Monday, uh, we are lucky to have a lunch uh, lecture uh, in the Willimon Room. Father Patrick Conroy, who's a Jesuit, who's a chaplain to the US House of Representatives, will be talking about uh, the, uh, the difficulties of being a chaplain in the U.S. House of Representatives, I suspect, right? Lunch will be served, so uh, please RSVP to that. And next Tuesday at this time, uh, we are going to have Professor Kristen Heyer uh, give a, a uh, lecture on immigration and scripture. Uh, Ted's book is going to be available at the door, and he would be available for signing it, should you wish. Our only task remaining is to thank the lecturer for coming. Fair.